Welcome to Baraboo 101, Part 1, A River and Its People. Let's begin with the river. It is the reason the city of Baraboo exists and why it is called Baraboo. The river has been called Baraboo or some variant of it for over 250 years. Of course, this is a very short period of time in the history of the river, and there are other names for the river, one of which we will learn a little bit later. The river, and particularly the stretch that goes through the city of Baraboo, has been the reason for human habitation here going back thousands of years. So a little bit about the Baraboo River. The Baraboo River is the fourth largest tributary of the Wisconsin River, and it starts northwest of Kendall in Monroe County. It empties into the Wisconsin River below Portage, Wisconsin, flowing through four counties. The Baraboo River watershed covers just about 420,000 acres. Today, 10 different communities now exist on or near the river, with Union Center in Juneau County being the smallest at about 200 people, and Baraboo being the largest with over 12,000 people. The Baraboo River is reported to be 120 miles in length. It is very hard to determine exactly how long the river is because in some places it is very winding. This stretch of river between Reedsburg and North Freedom has a total of 34 different curves. The Baraboo River is one of the main rivers in the Driftless region. This is the unglaciated region of southwestern Wisconsin and parts of neighboring states, and the region is full of hills and valleys, bluffs, and woods. Here in Sauk County, the Baraboo River enters Laval and Reedsburg before encountering the Baraboo Hills. The Baraboo River enters the Baraboo Hills at Rock Springs, or the Upper Narrows, before making its way through the city of Baraboo and exiting the Baraboo Hills at the Lower Narrows along Highway 33 east of Baraboo. The Baraboo River drops about 400 feet on its entire length and drops over 40 feet in the Baraboo area alone. The shallow areas and drops in elevations were conducive to human habitation for a variety of reasons. Long before the river was called Baraboo, it was known by its Ho-Chunk name and still is Hoguch Nishanak. Hoguch comes from Ho, meaning fish, and Gooch referring to shooting the fish. The shallow rapids in the Baraboo area were a great place to harvest fish, and the place at Baraboo is called Hoguch Aja. The name Baraboo has been the subject of much writing over the years. Some theories on its origin include the Indian word for river of many vines, the French word for catfish, or words related to a beautiful sandbar. The name actually comes from a man who was born about 325 years ago near Quebec. His name was Francois Berbeau, born November 4, 1698, in the small village of Lévis across from Quebec, which was the first French colony in 1608. By the time Francois Berbeau was born, the area that would become Wisconsin was claimed by France. This was after the reported first visit by Jean Nicolet in 1634 and the advent of the fur trade era. The French were eager to trade with indigenous people of the area for animal pelts, particularly that of the beaver. Worth billions in today's money, these pelts were sent to Europe to be used primarily to make hats. By 1747, Barbeau was living at the French outpost called Michilimackinac, a fort set up by the French in 1715 at the conjunction of three of the Great Lakes. In 1749, Barbeau received official permission to trade with the native people. Along with a party of several men in a birch bark canoe, they crossed Lake Michigan, entered 
Green Bay, and the Fox River, making their way upstream all the way to the Portage. After crossing the Portage, Barbeau and his party entered the Wisconsin River and floated a few miles downstream before encountering a small river entering the west side. It was here, most likely on top of a bluff, that Barbeau and his men set up a fur trading post in the winter of 1749-1750. Barbeau and his men would have set up a small trading post surrounded by a palisade and collected firewood for the long winter. After they were established, they started trading trade goods with the native people. Barbeau is known to have gotten a second permit to, for trade in 1752 and is believed to have come back to the same area. About 10 years after Barbeau left the area the second time, the French lost control of New France to the British after the French and Indian War in 1763. In 1766, a British expedition set out to explore the new territory required as a result of the war and see if there was indeed a Northwest Passage to the Pacific. One commander of the expedition, James Stanley Goddard, wrote the earliest mention of the Berber River, concretely tying the name to Francois Barbeau. Two leagues distance from the carrying place in the west side is a small river called River de Barbeau so-called from a Frenchman of that name, wintering in it many years ago. The Indians frequently go up this river to their winter hunting, in which they make a tolerable hunt, having plenty of deer, bears, raccoon, beaver, and etc. Since Francois Barbeau's time on the Barbeau River, there have been many spellings of the name ever since. It would not be until the 1840s that the spelling of Barbeau coalesced to what we know of as the current spelling. People have been living on or near the Berber River for thousands of years. Not too far away is Natural Bridge State Park. The natural bridge consists of a sandstone bridge reaching 35 feet in height, and it is the largest natural bridge in the state of Wisconsin. Underneath the rock bridge is the Radatz Rock Shelter. An archaeological excavation of the rock shelter conducted in 1957 found evidence of human habitation over a long period of time. The remains of 50 vertebrate species and 15 mollusk species were identified, including passenger pigeon, turkey, elk, wolf, bobcat, fisher, marten, and mountain lion. The oldest artifacts were pieces of charred wood, presumably from fire pits, which were dated to between 9000 and 8000 BC. Evidence indicates that the shelter was used only periodically at first, perhaps as a hunting or seasonal camp, and later it was inhabited year-round. The site is one of the oldest documented sites of human occupation in the upper Midwest. Certainly the people that lived here hunted on the Sauk Prairie and harvested fish on the Baraboo River. Another glimpse into life thousands of years ago was found next to the Baraboo River in 1845. While digging the foundation for a mill just south of the river near the Oak Street Dam, an entire woolly mammoth skeleton was found about eight feet below the surface. Unfortunately, the remains soon crumbled when exposed to air. In more recent past, a thousand to two thousand years ago, humans left other evidence of habitation along the river in the form of earthen mounds. It is estimated that at one time there were more than 15,000 mounds in Wisconsin. Primarily in southern Wisconsin and in neighboring states, they followed waterways and were often found near lakes and rivers. In Sauk County alone, there were as many as 1,500 mounds in three major categories, conical, linear, and effigy mounds. Conical mounds are the oldest, being simple domes of earth, followed by linear mounds, which are long, straight mounds, 
and then effigy mounds, which come in a variety of shapes modeled after animals and spirits. Perhaps the most famous mound in Sauk County and Wisconsin is Man Mound in the town of Greenfield, just northeast of Baraboo. Built approximately 750 to 1250 years ago, the Man Mound is the last anthropomorphic shaped mound known to exist and is now a National Historic Landmark. In 1872, historian and surveyor William Canfield produced a map of Baraboo which included many of the mounds that were here near the Baraboo River. Canfield drew over 125 mounds on this map, which we can see more clearly if we strip away everything else. There were certainly some mounds that he missed and others that were already destroyed, but Canfield's extraordinary work captured 125 mounds that were along this stretch of the river where the city of Baraboo and West Baraboo are today. The largest concentration was at the lower oxbow of the river, where over 90 mounds were shown by Canfield on the ridge above the river and in the floodplain. No other depiction of these mounds exists, and unfortunately all of the mounds in this area were destroyed by the construction of streets and buildings. If we look at the same area with LIDAR, or light detection and ranging, we can see the topography as well as faint outlines of streets and buildings. Overlay Canfield's map on the LIDAR imagery, we can see how the mounds were concentrated on hilltops, ridge lines, and down in the floodplain along the river. With LIDAR, it is also possible now to discover some remains of mounds that Canfield noted. In the western part of Baraboo, south of the Baraboo River, across from West Baraboo, Canfield noted a linear mound high upon a ridge. This linear mound is still partially intact next to the railroad cut put in in the 1890s. Nearby is another possible linear mound that Canfield seems to have missed. In general, about 90% of all mounds across Wisconsin have been destroyed, including here in Sauk County. One early Honey Creek farmer noted, We were rather irked by the large number of Indian mounds we had to plow down. There must have been at least 25 on our land. Some were shaped like animals and some like birds, and all were from three to five feet high. I suppose we should not have destroyed them, but they were then regarded merely as obstacles to cultivation, and everybody plowed them down. Descendants of the mound builders are the indigenous people of Wisconsin. The Ho-Chunk are one of those indigenous tribes. Many of their origin stories center around an area known as Red Banks near what is today the city of Green Bay. Their oral tradition also has stories of life here after the last ice age. In 1634, John Nicolay was sent west to meet with the Puans the ancestors of the Ho-Chunk. Nearly 40 years later, when Marquette and Joliet and their five companions became the first non-Indigenous people to traverse the Fox and Wisconsin waterways, they did not encounter the Ho-Chunk. After initial European contact, wars and disease almost wiped out the tribe. The tribe also split into two factions during the first half of the 1700s, with one group living in the Lake Winnebago area and along the Fox River, and the other group on the Rock River to the south. In 1766, Jonathan Carver, who was part of James Stanley Goddard's expedition, created this map to show what they discovered in this area. On the Fox River, the expedition encountered the Winnebago or Ho-Chunk Upper Town, 
and after portaging at the carrying place and entering the Wisconsin River, a few miles downstream they encountered the Sauk Indian tribe and the Sauk village on the prairie that bears their name to this day. Under the French and British regimes, the Ho-Chunk and other tribes of the area participated in the fur trade. The French and British weren't interested in settling these areas. Wisconsin became a territorial possession of the United States in 1783 after the American Revolutionary War. In the 1790s, one band of Ho-Chunk under the Decorah family set up a village along the Bear River near the portage. Technically, the British remained in control of the area until after the War of 1812, but after that, the United States established a presence in the area. In 1816, the first treaty between the United States and the Ho-Chunk was signed to end hostilities heightened by the War of 1812, in which the Ho-Chunk and the United States were on opposing sides. After the war, the Ho-Chunk and other Midwestern tribes began to fight amongst themselves, with war parties avenging past wrongs and fighting to secure new hunting territories. In an effort to delineate tribal boundaries and help lessen intertribal warfare, U.S. officials invited tribes to Prairie du Chien in 1825 to sign a treaty setting up boundaries for the tribes, including Ho-Chunk. The Ho-Chunk lands covered most of southeastern Wisconsin here on the map listed as Winnebago. Under U.S. control, the economy of the territory eventually shifted from fur trade to lead mining. Lead deposits in the area had been mentioned as early as 1673 by Marquette, and in 1766, Jonathan Carver noted lead mine hills just south of the Wisconsin River. News of lead being mined by indigenous people drew immigrants from throughout the U.S. and Europe to the area of northern Illinois and southwestern Wisconsin. Hundreds of miners and pioneers began trespassing on Ho-Chunk land in the 1820s, and the U.S. did little to intervene. Tensions came to a head in 1827 when a Ho-Chunk warrior named Redbird led an uprising which resulted in casualties near Prairie du Chien and sparked what became known as the Winnebago War. In the aftermath of the uprising, the U.S. Army constructed Fort Winnebago in 1828 near the portage of the Fox and Wisconsin Rivers in an attempt to maintain a military presence in the heart of Ho-Chunk or Winnebago territory. Another result of the uprising was that the Ho-Chunk were compelled to sign the Treaty of 1829, selling their land in southwestern Wisconsin for pennies an acre. This pushed the Ho-Chunk to areas to the northeast and north across the Wisconsin River in more increasing numbers. As a result of the treaty, an Indian agent or sub-agent Jonathan Kinsey was assigned to Fort Winnebago to handle the relations with the Ho-Chunk as well as make annuity payments. His wife, Juliet Kinsey, was the author of Waban, an excellent book on their life and times in this area in 1830s. Part of John Kinsey's job was to create a census of the Ho-Chunk so that annuity payments could be handed out by family. In 1829, Kinsey created a list documenting the Ho-Chunk and their villages in the area, including three on the Baraboo River. The Lower Baraboo River Village, headed by the Decora, had eight, in 1829 had 10 lodges and 200 people. The Middle Baraboo River Village in 1829 had three lodges and 50 people. The Upper Baraboo River Village had seven lodges and 135 people. Another village list was created by Kinsey in 1832. By this time, the Lower Baraboo River Village, the Decorah, had 38 lodges and 354 people. 
the middle Baraboo River village, which was now under the control of the Karamani family, had 27 lodges and 299 people. And the upper Baraboo River village, headed by Little Sioux, had 25 lodges and 244 people, all showing the growth in the area after the Treaty of 1829. The Karamani village was located in what is now the eastern part of the city of Baraboo, near the lower oxbow in the river. William Canfield's map notes an Indian council house built amongst the effigy mounds near the river and an Indian cornfield nearby on top of the hill. Later surveyors noted two remaining lodges in about 1845 near the corner of what is now Washington Street and College Avenue, indicating that the village lodges were on top of the ridge. The Ho-Chunk village was built along a particularly shallow stretch of the Baraboo River, which was an easy place to cross and a great place to catch fish. This included sturgeon, which could grow to more than six feet long. William Canfield in 1850 wrote about the Ho-Chunk. On these rapids were their fisheries, from which they obtained some of their supplies. There on the south side of the river, only a league distant, were their sugar camps, groves composed almost entirely of the sugar maple. I never beheld handsomer. They are nearly girdled down by their frequent tappings. Those small prairies and frequent thickets on the north side of the river made fine haunts and green pastures for deer and small game, as well as the lordly elk. On the range of bluffs between this place and the Wisconsin River on the south, on those heavy oak ridges are fields well calculated for the bear. In 1921, the newspaper in Reedsburg wrote, deer were then very plentiful in this region and late in the fall, bands of Indians with their ponies would make their yearly hunt southward for deer. After a couple weeks hunting, they would return to the Indian village with a bountiful supply of venison. On one of their hunting trips, as they returned through Loganville, in addition to a large quantity of deer meat on the back of their po back ponies, there also hung the pelts of a wolf and a lynx. The Ho-Chunk also hunted bear, which were in abundance. One visitor to a village near Reedsburg saw the carcasses of five full-grown black bears and two cubs hanging in the trees. The Ho-Chunk also harvested wild fruits, nuts, and raised some corn and potatoes for themselves and hay for their ponies. The potatoes were cut into small pieces or slices and dried, similar to dried apples. These were lighter to carry and not as damaged by the frost. The Ho-Chunk village at what is now the city of Baraboo was under the command of the Karamani family, and in particular, for a few years, Chief Nagaw Karamani, whose name Nagaw means wood and Karamani walking turtle. He was for a few years the principal chief of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Born about 1734, he was described as a warrior by profession, a successful leader in many a fight. He was described as a person of excellent disposition who preferred and courted peace. His upright conduct in connection with his military talents caused him to be respected and beloved. His conduct was patriarchal and his sway that of the parent rather than the master. The purpose and uniqueness of the council house at the Karamani village was a mystery until 2020 when an interview with Colin Karaman, descendant of Chief Naga Karamani, cleared things up. Mr. Karaman explained that all major disputes in the Ho-Chunk Nation had to be resolved at the council house in the Karamani village.
Alan Karaman, shown seated, was gracious enough to share oral history that solved the mystery of the council house here along the Baraboo River. His voice can be heard through a QR code on an interpretive panel along the Baraboo River Walk near the site of the Ho-Chunk Village. 2020, two interpretive panels installed along the Baraboo River Walk explain the Ho-Chunk Village, Chief Naga Karamani, and the more than 125 mounds that once existed within the city limits of Baraboo. The same year that Kinsey compiled his second annuity payment list in 1832, the Black Hawk War with the Sauk tribe broke out and added to the tension in the area. While the fight was primarily between the Sauk and the U.S. militia, different bands of Ho-Chunk played different parts in the conflict, some helping the U.S., some helping the Sauk, and others trying to remain neutral. In the aftermath of the Black Hawk War, another treaty, the Treaty of 1832, was forced upon the Ho-Chunk. This time they were forced to relinquish land south and east of the Wisconsin and Fox Rivers and were compelled to choose to move either to Iowa across the Mississippi River or to lands north of the Wisconsin and Fox Riverways. Most chose to go north and west and many came to the Baraboo River area. So for a short time, the Fox and Wisconsin waterways became the dividing line between American settled land to the south and east and Indian lands to the north and west. This included the land that would eventually become Sauk County. Besides the Karamani Ho-Chunk village at the lower Oxbow, there is a report of another Ho-Chunk village at the upper Oxbow. In 1918, Harry Ellsworth Cole wrote, at the time of the arrival of the earliest whites in Sauk County, a band of Indians had a village near the river in what afterward became the east part of the village of Lyons, today known as West Baraboo. It was at the crossing of the rapids, one part of the village being located on the island or inner portion of the Oxbow Loop, and the other and larger section along the opposite banks to the west. It is believed that this village was perhaps settled after the 1832 treaty forced hundreds of Ho-Chunk north of the Wisconsin River. Five years later, another attempt was made to remove the Ho-Chunk from all lands east of the Mississippi River. In the fall of 1837, 20 Ho-Chunk chiefs, including Chief Yellow Thunder, were invited to Washington to discuss matters with the president. Even though the delegation sent had no authority in the tribe to sign treaties, they were coerced, held hostage, until they signed the Treaty of 1837, forcing the Ho-Chunk to give up all of their lands in Wisconsin. They were told they would, eight, they would have eight years to move out when the actual treaty said eight months. The Treaty of 1837 extinguished all Ho-Chunk land title in the territory of Wisconsin, at least in the eyes of the United States government. Forced removal started in 1840 and lasted for another 34 years. However, at no time were all Ho-Chunk removed from the territory, and many simply walked back time and time again to their ancestral home homelands, and the Ho-Chunk are still here today. The Treaty of 1837 would make lands north and west of the Fox and Wisconsin rivers open to Euro-American settlement. This would include Sauk County. And in part two of Baraboo 101, we will look at the formation of Sauk County, its county seat, which eventually was Baraboo, and how the economy and city flourished here along the Baraboo River.